Thank you also for coming and for waiting until 2.30 on the, the very last session of this conference. Um, I wanted to talk today about evaluation because it is simultaneously so important to everyone, to everything that the university does, but also so difficult. It, it really is an, it's attempting to be an accurate reflection of learning and uh, you also need to at least try to be fair among learners, right? And try to be fair across courses and across you know, different institutions. So it is a really, really tall order, but it's also so important. So hopefully today what will happen is uh, you'll get a lot of ideas, maybe too many, but that's a good thing. Uh, but you'll have some time to think about them and incorporate little bits here and there, kind of like the idea from the, uh, the keynote this morning, the plus one idea. Think about one assignment and try to make that one a little bit more interesting. Uh, so again, my goals are just for you to kind of rethink part of your approach to evaluation. Um, I do have a handout or bibliography, and it's this giant link, and I, it didn't occur to me to make it more, more useful. Um, so I also have a tiny URL, which I can give you at the end, and I have a QR code, which I'll just load on my iPad, and if you want to just come and like take a picture of that by the time you leave, that will, um, that'll be fine. You can also email me, and I'll send it to you as well. Okay, so uh, I wanted to just first start by talking a little bit about assessment in a really kind of general, broad sense, and then the rest of it is going to be kind of workshop oriented. So you're going to get into little groups, don't panic, <laughs> um, and you'll work on addressing or creating assessments that would kind of get at a certain idea, okay? Um, so first of all, I wanted to talk a little bit about a traditional assessment. And if you were in the previous session, then you got a little bit of a sense of that in the, in the what the person inherited. Um, so typically, assessments are a, a long paper exam, and you have to fill in the answers, and everything is fine. Um, teachers often take pride in making exams really hard or really matching like everything and really capturing the, the things that are so important to them. Um, and they may or may not connect to what the students need. So you may know uh, Ken Bain, who is famous for talking about the, what the best college students do, what the best college teachers do, all of these things. And he says about this about his first semester. Like so many teachers, I failed to understand that testing and grading are not incidental acts that come at the end of teaching, but powerful aspects of education that have enormous influence on the entire enterprise of helping and encouraging students to learn. So really, you could spend a whole semester unpacking that statement. There are so many careful things that he's added to that. But I think it highlights really well what is important about assessment in general. Um, he's, he kind of criticizes himself later, um, saying that this approach to making exams that are kind of tricky and really difficult is not helpful for students, but also not helpful for him as a teacher because he's not getting the feedback that he needs to know whether the students are getting what they need and whether it's his fault or theirs. Uh, so first, a little a word on uh, terminology. Um, if you go into this kind of research at all, people will use a lot of different terms synonymously. It seems like the most consistent, uh, there are two, um, evaluation typically refers to what the students are doing. So if you're looking at what students have learned, you are evaluating their learning or evaluating uh, student learning. Assessment, on the other hand, is kind of a higher level or maybe like a meta-evaluation. Um, and so assessment should refer uh, most strategically or most uh, typically to courses, evaluating courses, whether the course is covering its objectives, whether a program is covering its objectives. So it's kind of taking a higher order um, look at the same thing. Okay. These are supposed to be animations which look like they're not animating. Okay, so some, uh, some general ideas about the purpose of evaluations. Um, I'm sure that you've thought of some of these, but there's a really nice list uh, that uh, we'll talk about here. So one of the things, the first thing that, that evaluations are going to do for you is that they're going to capture student attention and time. Okay, so it's, it's a way for them to practice. Um, it also will generate an appropriate learning activity. Okay, so it'll generate a test or it'll generate a project or some kind of proof of learning. So again, this idea of practice. It will provide feedback for them. Okay. 
It will help students to internalize the, students, uh, the discipline standards and notions of quality. So this is um, kind of tapping into or helping you tap into a student's um, desire to learn, inherent desire to learn. So rather than you saying, this is where you need to be, instead they look out and see, like, in, in the field of music, what does excellence mean? And as they, as they work through this, they become more familiar with this idea of, of standards and of quality. Uh, it generates grades, and it assures, this is kind of the assessment idea, assures the quality of the course or the program. These ideas come from Graham Gibbs, who is a British assessment um, educator, researcher. Okay, so now a little bit more about the ways that you can evaluate learning. So the first distinction that I want to make is that you can address the kind of learning that's happening, what you're trying to measure. Okay, so the first option would be that it's objective. Okay, so you're trying to get them to give you a single answer. Okay, and I'm not saying by, by contrasting these things um, that one is preferred over another, but rather that um, you might want to prefer certain ones in certain situations. So the, the kind of other end of the coin would be subjective, that there are multiple answers. Okay. Um, you might, for example, prefer objective, ob objectively oriented assessments in situations where you are just trying to get like a basic level of knowledge established. Right, so that students can give you a single correct answer. Um, whereas later in, say, grad school or something like that, when you don't want them to be kind of looking back in on knowledge, you want them to be kind of exploring and creating new knowledge, um, you want them to be able to be more subjective and finding lots of possibilities. Another important distinction among assessments and evaluations is when this kind of checking happens relative to the learning. So if it's summative, that means that you do all the learning and then there's the exam or the test or the paper or the project. Um, that's a really traditional approach. Uh, the other one is that there is the learning happening and there is testing happening at the same time. And the testing can contribute to the learning. Okay. So one way that, that, that people might incorporate that is with low stakes quizzes, okay, where you have like just a one question quiz and students are just taking that quiz and they're getting the feedback very early on. They're, they're trying to test their knowledge and uh, use it at the same time. And when they get that feedback that yes, I'm right or no, I'm not right, then they have a better sense of where they need to focus. Um, in the future. Um, before I get to this one, I would also say that based on things that I've heard today, I would add to this that you can also have um, evaluations coming from different sources, and this is not on my slide. So obviously evaluations can come from us, right? And those are kind of like the gold standard, but they're extremely time intensive, and depending on the size of your class, they might not be reasonable. Um, another way to incorporate that kind of feedback, though, is to use self-assessment, which my colleague just talked about, um, or to use um, peer assessments. And if you do one of the ones that is not you assessing them, and even if you do, if, if you are the assessor, it's always a good idea to have a rubric with really clear things that you're looking for. Um, and having students look at each other's work is also good for the person who's doing the review, not just for the person who's getting the review. Okay, and then finally, how the assessment or evaluation relates to a course grade. Okay, so either it is graded <laughs> and it contributes to a final grade. It is ungraded, so that means that it may be part of the learning process or maybe it's just something that you want them to have experience with, but you don't want it to filter into their grade. So again, maybe that's a, a really creative assignment and you want them to explore and you don't want to say yes or no. You don't want to shut them down. You want to just kind of leave it open and let them try things out. Maybe you don't want the results of that to figure into grades. And also whether um, you're just going to give them comments or not. Okay, So, so feedback can be very uh, helpful to students, but only if they read it and internalize it. Okay, uh, We can talk about some ways to uh, make that more likely as well. OK, so ways to talk about learning. OK, so then finally, I wanted to go into Okay, some basic problems. These are kind of like inherent problems in all evaluations. Um, and maybe you've talked about these already, especially if you're in the Teal school. But the idea is that, direct, that learning is not something you can directly observe. You can't just like cut open someone's brain and say with your checklist, yes, no, yes, <laughs> you, can't, you can't do it that way. So the only way that you can assess learning is through kind of indirect measures. Can they use this? Can they demonstrate it in some way? And so to that extent, it's a very several steps removed 
um, what you're evaluating. Um, and so basically everything that you're using is an ind indirect measurement, and it's therefore imperfect. Okay, so it's, it's a representation of the learning that you are interpreting. Okay, so twice removed from the actual learning. Um, typically when this is discussed, it's discussed as being a balancing of reliability versus validity, on the other hand. Okay, and uh, these are really kind of technical details, but I would like to just kind of get it out there so that you can think about this as well. So the idea with reliability is that you'll have the same tests, uh, the same results from the same test give, if you give it to multiple students. So all of your incoming science students will always have the same kind of bell curve, for example. So that's telling you that the test itself is a reliable measure more or less. The other idea is whether or not it's valid, whether it's actually measuring what you want it to measure. Okay, um, so if you imagine that you have like a history test that's written for high validity, okay, so it's really measuring what you want it to measure, knowledge and learning, um, it might be a lot of short answers, it might be essays, um, and it's really a good gauge of whether or not they know what they need to, but it's harder to score accurately across different populations, depending on whether they use the right terms, okay, whether you're going to count those or not. So it's harder to score, but it's a better measure. Okay? And then on the other hand, you could have a test that's written for high reliability. So in that sense, it would be very easy to score, but less good a measure of what you want them to learn. Okay? So in that case, it might be a multiple choice test, okay? but that you know that guides the kind of questions you'll ask. Like, when did the revolution happen? When did this happen? You know, it's really different kinds of questions. It's not how, right? It's not why. And those are often the more important learning objectives. So keeping in mind what your goals are is going to help you determine how you're going to balance those things and what kind of assessment you want to design, OK? So it's often framed uh, this way. The more reliable a measure of learning it is, the less valid it tends to be. And that's, that's just kind of the way it is. Obviously, you try for high things <laughs> on both ends. Uh, and you probably are not going to find evaluations that are low on both. But you don't want it to only be one all the time and have all of your assessments be exactly the same. OK, so now I wanted to do a bit of a workshop. So this is where the group idea comes in. So I actually have no idea how many of you there are. So what I have in mind is that I want you to get into groups of maybe five people. Uh, five to ten, and sit in an area where you can kind of talk to each other. And then I want you to choose one person to be a recorder, just to type down the ideas. And then I want you to send one person down to me to get your one learning objective. Okay. So I'm going to give you a learning objective, and then I want you to come up with at least three assessments that will get at that learning objective. So I'll give you an example, <laughs> just so that you know kind of what I'm looking at or looking for. Um, and once, once we have, I'll, give you, I'll give you about five minutes to work on those, so it's not, it's not going to be super perfect. Okay, don't worry about the high everything, um, but just get some ideas flowing. So if uh, my group uh, was assigned comparing and synthesizing information, I might come up with these three assignments. So the first one could be a research paper or a presentation, okay? And that's going to get at comparing and synthesizing information because obviously students are going to the library, they're getting information, they're going to find con conflicts and they're going to have to reconcile those. So that's a really formal way. Another could be an annotated bibliography where they're coming across all these different sources and they have to distill from them what is important and maybe compare them to earlier or later sources. Um, another way would be to write a dialogue between, say, two peers, for example, one who really knows something and one who has lots of questions. And so they could write out the whole dialogue like, oh, I thought it meant this. And the, the expert could be like, oh, no, no, it's this. And then they would get to practice writing out um, both, both sides of that idea. OK, so get into a small group and send one person down here to collect your special topic. You may need to move your seat so that you can talk together. Okay. Let's hope I have enough. Okay, so yours will be. Oh, I, oh, I need to write something. You need to write this down? <laughs> I think you'll be able to remember it. Okay. Curiosity. Developing curiosity. Developing curiosity about what? Learning. Whatever your topic is. So, how would you, what kind of assessments would develop curiosity? Okay. So, yours will be to ability to give and create and 
and take, incorporate constructive criticism. So just focus on in constructive criticism. Okay? All right. So yours is improvement over time. What kind of assessments will help students get better over time? Yours will be creativity or invention. Ability to apply information, so application. And yours is collaboration. How can students work together? Okay, yours will be, oh, how do I say this? Okay, so reviewing their knowledge, identifying what's weak, what's strong, and how to fix that. Okay. <laughs> What kind of assessments would help? Critical thinking. Organizing thoughts into an argument. What kind of assessments would help? Okay, so spend five minutes talking about your topic. I know some of them are really kind of weird, but I want to see what you can come up with, okay? Learning objectives don't all have to be the same, okay? Don't focus on content. Shh. Shh. Just a minute. This is a key thing. Don't focus on content. Okay, because we're all from different areas. Focus on the, the ideas that will help students develop those skills. Okay? Your content will change depending on what class you're teaching. Okay? Go ahead. Okay, finish up your discussion and then face front. Okay, so what I'd like to do in the last... What I'd like to do in the last little bit of time is just share some ideas. So maybe go over with your group, go back in your group for 20 seconds, decide on one person to talk for your group, and also uh, which your best idea is and why. Okay? 20 seconds, go. <laughs> Okay, so we don't need to go in any specific order, and if your group really feels unprepared, I'm not going to call on you, okay? Um, but I would love to hear some, some just discussion, just to get your ideas flowing. I think you probably are all at least semi-experts now in your topic, okay? But you may not feel your topic is applicable to any courses you teach. So hopefully this cross-pollination idea will be helpful. So is there a group who would like to volunteer to go first? Okay, I, I'm sorry, you're too slow. <laughs> So I'm going to need to share with you my, my microphone. So tell us your topic and your solution. So our topic is the ability to apply information. And uh, one way we thought we might measure that is to do role plays where we have peer evaluation. So you can't really fake it. You have to impress your peers and show them that you, you have the ability to apply it. So that works in fields where there's not necessarily a right answer. In my field, there is a right answer. I do computer programming. So the idea that we have is, is testing. So we can write test programs. And if your program gets the right answer, if you did it correctly, then I can prove that you got the right answer. And if you don't get the right answer, then the test will fail. But that can guide the students. That can help them know maybe where the problems in their sure. program is. Sure. So a couple approaches. Great. Lovely ideas. Two. Another group. You, you were really sure. excited. We've got two. Okay, we have two, two microphones. Test, so. test. So take your own microphone. There you go. <laughs> Just kind of talk into that. <laughs> okay. Got it. Perfect. So ours was developing curiosity, which I think is, was a tough one, but we came up with three <laughs> and picked a, the best one. So we, we liked the idea of having students interview someone who has a passion about a particular subject, which maybe you don't but you're required to interview them to, d to spur your curiosity and then make a personal connection to that, whatever that topic might be. Nice, very nice. And then with any of these, you can decide what you think is the most way, appropriate way to assess student learning or evaluate student learning, whether or not you feel like you need to provide comments, give them some kind of test afterward, have them write it up. Sometimes just having like a half page reflection is enough of a, a helpful motivator for students. More options, more groups. Yeah, come on down. So tell us your topic and your preferred solution. 
this work? It should. Okay. <laughs> um, so our topic was reviewing knowledge, weak, strong, how to fix it. Uh -huh. And so one idea that we came up with was to have them kind of interview each other or like do a peer assessment of each other and then mentor each other in because each of them is going to know things that the Different other things. does not know. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Other, other groups? <laughs> yeah, we have a volunteer. Here, I'll come and meet you halfway. Make everyone turn sideways. <laughs> Great. Um, we had critical thinking, and our idea was to have students debate different topics, but also be prepared for the opposite um, to their own position. Opinion. To their own. Ah. Mm -hmm. That way they're prepared for both sides. Uh -huh. So that they're more logical rather than emotional. Yes. Great. More options. Other, other groups? Is there someone here? Yeah, maybe I should come to you. You can't get out. <laughs> Jump over everybody. Um, so ours was uh, giving constructive criticism. And so our thought was to do um, kind of peer evaluations where they can give constructive criticism to their peers, but then also doing some self-reflection where they give constructive nice. criticisms to themselves nice. so that they can kind of... Yeah. Have some different sorts of practice. Great, great. With this um, idea of cr incorporating criticism, I was really thinking about uh, certain fields really require you to work in groups to get certain things done. And it's really important that you be able to give feedback, couch it in a way that people can use it, and also be able to use it yourself without getting defensive and taking it personally, which is normal. <laughs> Other groups who want to talk? No? Go ahead, just yell, just yell. Rebecca suggested that for a final project or a big project, we have students vote on which one is most creative Ooh. and then have some kind of prize, like extra credit or some fun prize to reward the most creative project. Uh -huh. Cool. Uh, depending on the course and how this might fit into your course objectives or learning objectives, you might also use that as a, a, one of the kind of motivators could be not taking the final exam or having the final exam replace other exam scores that maybe they didn't do so well on or something like that. Any other ideas that you want to share? Wonderful. OK, so we have a few more minutes. Um, I just want to end with, um, let's see if I can turn this. I'll mute it. OK. So I wanted to talk just with a, a few uh, last takeaways. Um, one of the things that instructors often complain about is that students don't do things that are not graded. OK, so we kind of criticize students for being so grade oriented, right? But for students, that's a really important aspect of what they're here for. This learning is not the only thing that they need. They don't just need the diploma. They don't just need to learn the things. They need good grades to get scholarships or you know, good jobs and things like that. Um, so instead of criticizing them, uh, there has been some research done on this. And it's true. As much as 95% of student time is spent on things that they think will be assessed. Okay. 95%. So that, I mean, you can take that either way. You can say, oh, clearly they're just being strategic learners. Or you can say, they really want to make sure that they learn the material well to do well on these things that I'm looking at. Okay. And you can turn it around, too. You can say, if I know students are only are going to spend the most time on these things that I'm assessing, I'm going to make my assessments be as useful to them as possible, as applicable to the real world as possible. Okay, and doing that, I think, would involve testing them in different ways, not just doing multiple choice tests for all of your exams, for example. And I'm sure none of you do that. Um, but, but taking a little bit more creativity in terms of what your goals are for them. Okay, and recognizing that, the, that content goals are not the only thing that are, are helpful. Um, so some, a few takeaway ideas would be that you might want to reverse engineer your evaluation. So you might start with these learning objectives, the way I kind of assigned your group one, um, and then kind of go from what you want students to be able to do, determine the things that will strengthen those. So that's kind of what your group was doing, and then decide how to formalize your evaluation of that task. Okay. Um, you should also obviously consider ways to lighten your grading load. So that, that includes things like having Canvas grade things that are multiple choice. There's no need for you to, to grade true or false things. Uh, so have Canvas do that. Use Scantron, whatever you can. 
uh, but don't spend your time doing that. If you assign papers or writing assignments, make sure that it's clear you have one main thing that you're looking for. Okay? Don't circle every comment. Don't circle misspellings. Okay? It's really hard for students to get that back and think, okay, I have a lot of random errors and I don't know what to do next time. Okay, I don't know how to get bigger from here. It's much more helpful for you to read their paper, summarize what they did well, what they need to focus on, and give them a score based on that. Okay, it's much more easy to look at that kind of response that is personalized, that takes a lot of your time, okay, but, but is useful time, I think, um, to, to do it that way rather than, than circling every little detail. Those are the low-hanging fruits. It's really easy for students to go in and fix the capital F you know, and, and take out that comment, but they're still missing those those important goals. So be careful what kind of assessment you assign based on what kind of feedback you're going to need to give and how much time of yours it's going to take. And also consider using multiple methods of evaluation to get an overall more fair sense of, of final grade to represent learning. Okay? The way that grades often occur in classes is that it's just kind of like uh, a measure of learning, yes, but also of can you do the things in the format I want. Okay? Can you use the right margin sizes? Do you have a number two pencil? <laughs> like Some things that are not necessarily reflective of learning, but are also tied into ability to do well in school. So there may be people who are learning more who are getting lower grades just because of formatting issues. Okay? Um, then the last thing would be to uh, consider ways to help students understand what, how they learn best. And I know a lot of us are not specialists in this. Um, but you probably want to involve them in learning about what it's like to learn. They know firsthand what's happening. Um, so there's this really interesting uh, quick quiz that you can take on NPR, and you can link to it if you want to come and uh, get my, my scan me QR code at the end. Um, and this is basically looking at 10 persistent myths about learning. And it's just given to a large sample of the population. And by and large, they were very bad <laughs> at being right on these things. Um, and then the last question was that despite their overall poor showing, the fact that they did so poorly on so many of these questions, more than 75% of responders considered themselves to be above average in their ability to judge the work that teachers do. Okay? So even though they are not necessarily competent at judging the, the things that happen with learning, uh, a lot of people feel that they are competent at judging teaching. Okay? And as teachers, that should be very alarming to you. <laughs> so, so we do have a few more minutes for questions if you have questions, or you can just come down here and take your picture of the QR code. I'll leave it here so that we don't need to clog up the room. But if you have questions, please. One okay, one, I'm sorry, one question. <laughs> I only want the best question. <laughs> yeah. Can you provide some examples of ways to help students figure out how they learn best? How they learn best? Yeah, so I, I'm, I am a little bit concerned because part of one of the questions actually that this quiz asked was about learning preferences. This persistent myth that people have uh, that are visual learners or auditory learners or any of these things, uh, that if you get information in your preferred method, then you learn it better or you retain it better, which is not true. Um, it's a convenient myth, and it's, you know, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't include visuals and audio and all of those things, um, but just that, that people don't have to have certain things in certain ways to be successful. Um, I would say that students need the same things, that they need uh, an introduction to the material, they need lots and lots of practice time, so the more that you can do to help them practice it with low-stakes quizzes where they're kind of re-engaging all the time, um, is really helpful, and also ways to make it seem real. So students are going to retain uh, this kind of like mental uh, contents based on how useful things are to them or how useful they think they will be. So if you're making them learn things like that they think they will never need, it's going to be stored in temporary knowledge and then it'll just be gone. So if you can connect it to things that they do in real life, have them connect it to prior knowledge, those are all really good ways to, to help them learn it long term. I would also say read, um, read whatever you can about, about learning. Okay, there's a great book called Make It Stick. Uh, by Peter Brown that would help you with all these kind of basic um, myths.